So overlanding for me is um, it's, it's an adventure in, in, in life that allows us to come into contact with nature enjoy, and appreciate the journey along the way in getting to see the wildlife and all the parks and things like that that Southern Africa has to offer and the whole of Africa actually. Not that we've been that far, but um, we've certainly had a good taste of Southern Africa and East Africa, which has been a great experience for us. And also for me, I don't know about you as well, Dave, but um, the fact that it brings family together, um, it brings friends together, because whenever we go, we try and go in a nice big group and have a great time together. It's very, um, for me, it's, a, it's been an important part of my family life. And it's also been an important part for my kids to have an appreciation for nature um, as well, you know. So for me, it's it's getting away from the hustle and bustle of the city. It's getting out into the bush where it's just peace and quiet and sitting around a fire talking nonsense and talking about what's been happening in the day. But the added extra element to, element to me, which is what Pippa, my wife, said after our first um, adventure. And she said, you know, Dave, I think you enjoy it so much because for once you're in an element where you're on equal footing with everybody else. When you're driving your car and you're out in the game park or you're out to overlanding or you're going through a rough track, everybody's having to deal with the same thing that you're having to deal with. So you're not dependent on them. And she's quite right, you know, because I am. I'm, I'm, I'm in control of what we're doing there and doing exactly the same or having to face exactly the same things other people who are driving or having to face. So yeah. it has got that element, but it's just the camaraderie of, of traveling as well. You know, when, you, when we meet up with uh, John and, and we get together and then the fun begins. And, you know, I'm his oldest brother and I've got to look after him uh, and make sure that he behaves himself on these trips. <laughs> <laughs> so we pull each other's legs quite a lot. Uh, he obviously done a better job than I have. Well, I've taken um, yours off, so yeah. we are. Um, but we, we have a lot of fun on these trips. And uh, But I love the bush, and that, that really is what it's all about. I didn't think I would be able to do it to this extent, you know. And it's only when John um, had a trip to Moremi some years back, and he said, you know, Dave, at third, we were at Third Bridge, and he said, the campsite is flat, and he said, the ground is hard, you could do this. And I said to Pippa, hmm, that's interesting. And from there, it, it, we did. I got myself second-hand uh, discovery. Which incidentally was probably your biggest mistake, but anyway. Yeah, it's yeah. a great vehicle. Um, and <laughs> then it made all the mistakes every rookie makes. And we built far too much stuff, so we bought a trailer, which was another mistake. Uh, and off we went. And, you know, the first trip was a real learning curve. The trailer broke twice. Uh, the Where was the, it? Was it Mabua? So Mabua, yeah. yeah. And the trailer broke on the way into Mabua. Why? Because uh, you thought it was a freeway in South Africa. I was just up, trying to keep up with Graham. Kilometers an hour. I was trying to keep up with Graham. And we hit a few bumps. Um, so I broke the A-frame. Uh, but we had that welded overnight uh, by some bloke who drove up from uh, Chabong. Chabong. When it was fixed, we left the next day at lunchtime and driving up the cut line up to Kinsey, I think the place is called, the um, bolt for the, uh, the the suspension snapped. So the box dropped on the wheel. Can I just tell the rest of the story? Yes. Because I was driving down, David, quite a bit behind, and all I could see was this thing like pivoting. No, that was the first that was, yeah, yeah, well, there was pivoting like a seesaw on, on the back of his car. And I thought, this doesn't look right to me from where I am, because now there's dust and there's the, the trailer. And eventually now I had to get into um, sp high speed mode with my trailer as well. And I started overtaking David on these race tracks, like <laughs> sand tracks. And eventually I had to like wait, flag him down because the trailer was about to break in half. Mm -hmm. And so we stopped on the side of the road anyway, and we managed to Load everything into other it, cars? Into yeah. cars and then leave the trailer there and off we went and camped at Nossa Bagola, I think it was, yeah. A bit further on we hit a really sandy patch and I've been going a little bit fast and Pippa says, Dave, I think you need to slow down again. 
So I slowed down, <laughs> right onto the chassis. We were in this thick sand. So I fall out the one side. I said to Pippa, you try and dig out in front of the wheels and I'll see if I can get underneath and try and tear something from under the chassis. So I was under the car scraping stuff out furiously. And then as I was doing it, the car was kind of slowly dropping. And I thought, this isn't so good. So I tried to get out. And then I realized I haven't got legs. I can't hook it on my ankles and pull. But I managed to get my hand on the bottom of the car and hauled myself out. And the car has just carried on sinking. So I said to Pippa, right, we're going to have to try and just go. So I get back in the car and I said, I'm just going to gun it. I forgot all the training I'd had. Don't spin the wheels. Do, don't do this, don't do that. And I just put the accelerator low range, went like hell. And I think what happened is that with the Land Rover, it's, you know, with the air suspension, it's got that um, emergency thing. So I think the suspension of the chassis dropped more because of the wheels spinning and it actually kicked it into extended mode. And that gave it, lifted the thing off and I just felt the car moving. I thought, right, boy, here we go. And I left the trailer there carried on to Malm the next day and then phoned the bloke who had come up from Sabong to fit, to weld the A-frame and asked if he'd be prepared to go the other way and collect the trailer and then take it back to Sabong and we'd pick it up on our way three weeks later after the, we had finished the rest of the trip, which he did. Fantastic guy. It was a learning experience. It really taught me that Pippa and I needed to be, after that, we need to be careful. We can't easily go venturing off into the into the wild unknown on our own without some sort of backup or communication because there was no communication. We didn't have satellite phone or anything like that. So But I think over the years now we've learned to drive a little bit more in convoy for you yeah, to yeah. to have that backup if needed. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But it's it's all learning, you know, Joe. And and I think one one grows with learning stuff like that. You know, you it sort of knocks you on the head a bit and gets you a little bit more grounded sometimes um but it's all worth it you know when we when we do get to be in the bush and you have that first fire going in the evening and you have a little whiskey or whatever your tipple is it's it's all, worth it. all worth and then, then the peace and serenity of being out in the bush for just takes over lovely As a kid, I always wanted to be a game ranger, and it was like my dream, that or farmer. And uh, as it turned out, I got into a career that was diametrically opposed to being a game ranger in a way. So when I came into retirement, um, I'd already been doing a lot of overlanding before that. And, and so this has been an outlet for me to start my business, which has been look, obviously not a great start with COVID around, but at the end of the day, it's allowed me to get into it slowly um, and so, yeah, it's it's been an enabler for me having this overlanding experience. Mm. And also, I think the fact that I've I've learned a lot from David's experiences as well, in the fact that he's a disabled person who's able to kind of come and share this beautiful environment with us. My kids have benefited from David being around as well, because you know, if David and Pippa ever need a help or in any way, they're there in an instant mm. to help. And it's just. As brothers, I think it's we've always been close. We've been a tight knit family all our all our lives, really. But I think this experience has been great from our relationship point of view as well, and and uh, relationships with Judith and my who's my wife and and Pippa. Um, you know, it's been it's been a really good, strong bonding experience through shared adventures, mm. really. You know, for anybody w with a disability who feels that they aren't able to share this type of experience and do this type of thing, they can, but it needs a lot of preparation. We didn't prepare well enough. We were lucky, we got away with it, but you need to have a lot of preparation. My suggestion would be to go to a proper um, 4x4 specialist and get training, get an understanding of what you're going to be dealing with in sandy situations, mud or whatever it is, uh, rocks. Um, and it, it's to, to be prepared, but not to the extent that you're going to take away the excitement of the whole journey. You've got to have some adventure to look forward to. I think when you do overlanding, the attitude that you've got to have is, is, is completely open-minded. 
Um, you know, you've got to know that you're going to meet up with some difficult people sometimes. You've got to know that you're going to have some difficulty with some border officials on occasion. You're going to have to have difficulty with some of the police along the way. You're going to have difficulty, you know, like when you're packing your car, for example, if you have a puncture and you need to get your toolkit to be fix the puncture, make sure that you've packed it in an accessible way because otherwise you're going to start getting angry with yourself because you haven't, I've done it before, I have a, had a puncture and the the toolkit was like dug under, it was was buried under all of the kit. So we had to unpack the car and, and you know, all of those kind of things test your patience if, um, if you don't prepare and pack it correctly. But you've got to have, you know, you've just got to have the right level of patience when you're doing this kind of thing. And I think, I think the dynamic in the group of people that you're with makes an important, um, plays an important role. You've got to, I think communicating freely and, and openly with people about the issues that you're facing is vitally important. Don't bottle things up and um, and have a short fuse about certain things because one person hasn't spoken to the other and there's an expectation issue that's gone awry. And um, I think the other thing is as well, don't don't plan a trip with a very tight schedule. You've got to allow for things to go wrong yeah. and for time to correct. Exactly. And things do go wrong. And if your schedule is very, very tight, you're going to end up stressing yourself out if you have a breakdown and you have to stop for two days to, for that, then it's yeah, you have the rest. Yeah. Absolutely. So allow rest days so that you can use those rest days to correct. And, and also just to recover. Because I mean, let's be honest, it's a, it's when you're sitting around driving for six mm. or seven hours at a time, mm. for two or three days in a row, you need to have a break mm. in between. You know, you need to have that time where you can just walk around and stretch your legs. Sure. Well, sorry, not in your case, but no, stretch well. <laughs> But in other instances, you you know you've got to just have a break from being behind the steering wheel and sitting behind the car doing nothing. You know. Thank you so much to all of you who've made our films possible. We really appreciate all the support you've given us. If you'd like to continue this journey with us, please like and subscribe, or support us through Patreon.